Now, there's a uh, very popular bumper sticker that has been around for a long time which says, prayer changes things. Now, what would you do if you have prayed and nothing has changed? What would you do if you have prayed and nothing has changed? This was the issue confronting the prophet Habakkuk, which was the topic we discussed last week and which we shall continue today. The title of this message is Beyond Comprehension. The major theme of this book is that God is incomprehensible and his ways are beyond understanding. Now, the book of Habakkuk is a recording of the prophet's argument with God because he struggled with understanding God's ways. He's been praying for a long time for his people and his nation, Judah, that God would do right for them even though they were doing wrong and in the wrong. But God was silent. There was no answer and Habakkuk was confused. He couldn't figure out why things are going on like it is if God is who he is. Now, if you are ever prayed to God in your life, then you can relate to his experience. You believe that prayer changes, prayer changes things because God can't change things and nothing is impossible with God. But there are times that God does not change things. And if he does, he changes things not the way we want things changed. So in this scenario, what would you do? Now, I am reminded of the little boy who wrote his prayer to God saying, Dear God, it was Christmas time and he prayed and he wrote it down. He said, Dear God, I've been a very good boy, and I want a bicycle. Then he stopped. He thought, well, God would not believe that I'm a very good boy. So he crumpled the paper, he threw it in the trash can, he wrote again. Dear God, I've been a very good boy most of the time. Then he stopped. I think God would not believe that either. He was... He crumpled the paper, he threw it in the trash can again, and he stood up. He went to their living room where there was a little manger that had little statues of Mary and Joseph. And then he picked up the statue of Mary, wrapped it in a piece of cloth, and then wrapped it with a rubber band, the whole thing. And then he went back to his writing saying, Dear God, if you ever want to see your mother again, you better give me that bicycle. We smile at this, but we often have the same attitude in, when it comes to prayer. We want, what God, we want God to give us what we want, and we want it now. But God can't be dictated upon. He is God, we're not. He does what he pleases. We can't coerce, blackmail, or bargain with God, or argue with God to get the way to get things our way. But Habakkuk does it anyway, and like us, he will eventually learn to do things God's way. And this was his first question that he posed to God in his argument with God. God, why are you not doing anything? This is essentially Habakkuk's question as we look at verses 2 and 4. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Howard Hendricks, a Bible commentator called Habakkuk, asked the man with a question mark for a brain. The man with a question mark for a brain. He was like a little boy who asked too many questions of a parent. Why do I have to eat vegetables? Why do I have to brush my teeth? Why do I have to go to school? Why, do I, why is the sky blue? I'm reminded of that woman who, uh, the wife who uh, constantly 
convince the husband to go to church. But the husband kept asking, why do I have to go to church? Why do I have to go to church? Give me one reason why I have to go to church. The exhausted wife said, because you're the pastor. <laughs> well, it took a lot of convincing for my wife to get me to church today. I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, but if you ever felt like you have a few questions to God, then this book is for you. Some people think that to question God is inappropriate. You should not question God. But the truth is, it's better to question or even argue with God than ignore Him. If we ask questions of God, it means that we are searching for the mysteries, answers to the mysteries of life or problems of life and we believe that the answer only comes from God. In other words, we believe that he's real and he is concerned about what's happening in our lives. Amen? If we don't challenge God, the implication is maybe we have given up on God. Maybe we are indifferent to God or worse, we have stopped believing in God. And so, go ahead, open your hearts to God. I encourage you. Open your hearts to God without fear. The psalmists do that a lot of times. In the psalm, a third of them is called lament. In these psalms, the psalms air out their hurt, their pain, their frustrations, disappointment, even anger to God. And so God, if you do that, God actually already knows the state of your heart, right? Whatever it is that you may share to him, it's nothing new to him because he already knows. But when you do it, you're actually bringing yourself closer to God, therefore, into a deeper relationship and understanding of God's character and ways. It builds intimacy. It does not destroy it. So be completely open and honest before God. Share your frustration. And if you have any anger towards God, Go ahead. God is a big God. Habakkuk in his book certainly didn't hide his frustration and disappointment with God. Habakkuk saw his people in rapid moral decline. And that's because they rejected God and the morals of God. The result was injustice, toleration of wrongdoing, murder, immorality, and all kinds of violence. Let's read on. Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked him in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Habakkuk is describing his society, but it's a society actually that is very similar to ours, isn't it? In fact, it is a description of most societies in the world because that is what's going to happen to a society that is against God and anything that God stands for. If you make a survey today, you will, show, you will find that more, even here in Australia, more and more people are feeling unsafe. They feel unsafe to walk the streets, especially at night or especially in the train station, even while they are at home because violence of any kind, break in, steal, murder, rape, all kinds of criminality have become the norm in our society. And you can only, you can see the truth of this by listening to the evening news. And criminals are becoming younger and younger because the legal system is lenient, almost permissive to their nefarious behavior. According to a National Homicide Monitoring Program report, on average in Australia, one woman per week is murdered by her current or former partner. One woman per week. Almost 10 women a day are hospitalized for assault injuries perpetrated by a spouse or domestic partner. In 2019 alone, 3,600 women were hospitalized for assault injuries and the perpetrator was a spouse or a domestic partner. In Australia, domestic violence is considered a national crisis 
and a national shame. How does the government respond to this crisis? More funding, more advocates, more consultations, more advertisements for more respect for women. And the result is more of the same. The solution is not more of any or all of that, but more people to trust God and more respect for the word of God. Amen? Violence is the result when men ignore God because they become so self-centered that the most important thing for them is self-fulfillment. That's why people kill for sex, they kill for money, and they kill for power. When men ignore God, the strong consumes, devours the weak in pursuit of selfish desires. The more a society increasingly is against God and the God of the Bible, Christianity and the God of the Bible, the more a society is increasingly violent and morally decadent. These societies have governments that have passed legislations that have redefined marriage as set out by God. They have promoted homosexual agenda and removed all distinctions between man and woman. They have removed all the traces and symbols of God and Christianity. They have removed the name of God in their national anthem like in Switzerland. And there's a similar move in Canada. They have removed the Lord's Prayer in public schools and government functions like in the United States. Here in Victoria, the Labour government and Green Party is moving to remove the Lord's Prayer during their parliamentary session. And the Labour, Victorian Labour government is even moving farther against God. There is a proposed law that it makes it a crime to counsel or to pray for someone who is struggling with sexual identity or gender identity or sexual orientation. Even though that person may want it or require, it doesn't matter because if that law makes it a crime, it is considered as conversion therapy. It means that anyone who breaks the law, whether it's a teacher, a parent, a pastor, a preacher, or a friend that prays over that person who is struggling with gender equality, you can't pray for that person and tell that person that God created man and woman only and nothing in between because that will be a crime. And if you break that law, if that law passes, you will be fined $10,000 or up to 10 years in jail. Dr. Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Aller Allergy and Infectious Diseases and chief medical advisor to the President of the United States, told the World Health Organization that the first acts of the Joe Biden presidency is to revoke the so-called Mexico City policy. I don't know if you've heard of that. The Mexico City policy, also known as the global gag rule, bans foreign NGOs or non-government organizations from performing or promoting abortions as a condition of receiving U.S. family planning aid. In other words, this policy means that if your group is pro-abortion, you won't receive any funding from the U.S. government. This policy was introduced by Ronald Reagan in 1984 and continued by his Republican successors like George Bush and Donald Trump. But it has always been repealed by every Democratic president like Obama and now Joe Biden. Dr. Fauci said the World Health Organization, to the World Health Organization, President Biden will be revoking the Mexico City policy in the coming days as part of his broader commitment to protect women's health, which means pro-abortion, and advance gender equality, which means 
normalizing homosexuality and same-sex marriage at home and around the world. Kamala Harris used two Bibles when she was sworn in as the first woman vice president of the United States. Two Bibles. And Joe Biden used a very thick and old Bible in his inauguration. Apparently, our premier, Dan Andrews, also believed in the veracity of the Bible because he's sworn in by the Bible at the inquiry of the hotel quarantine fiasco. But it is all for a show. Nothing more, nothing less. These people want to tell the world that they believe in God even as Christians. But it doesn't matter how many Bibles you use or how old or how thick your Bible is, if you stand against what God's Word says, you are against God. That is why you have a society that, has, that is into a lot of moral and social problems without lasting solutions. This is exactly the case in the land of Judah. The people has forsaken God, and so God gave them what they wanted, a society without God, and therefore a society full of violence, tolerance of wrongdoing, immorality, destruction of life and strife, and conflict in relationships and marriages. As it has been said, if we insist on our own way, God will see to it that we get it, but we may live to regret it. The end result of forsaking and forgetting God is always worse than what we thought it would be. George MacDonald writes, in whatever man does without God, he must fail miserably or succeed more miserably. Judah was miserable due to the evil and violence that pervades their society. And Habakkuk asked God in his mercy to fix their problems. But God was silent. If God is silent, if you can't hear God, one of two things, that's true of you. If you can't hear God, if God seems to be silent, one of two things is true of you. One, you're not a Christian. Jesus said, my sheep hears my voice and they follow me. John 10, 27. My sheep hears my voice, I know them and they follow me. If you have, can't hear God, if God is silent, perhaps you're not a child of God. The solution is repent. Confess your sins and receive Jesus, the Son of God, as your Lord and Savior, and you become a child of God. Then God will speak to you. Listen, and he will speak. Second, if God is silent, if you can't hear God, you may be a Christian, you may be a child of God, but you can't hear because one, you're not praying. Or second, we are in sin. Isaiah 59 verse 1 and 2 says this, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. One of the reasons of God's silence is because we can't hear even if he is speaking because that's because we're holding on to a sin in our life. If God is silent, check your heart. Are you in compromise? Do you have an unconfessed sin? Have you broken the principle of God? That's why you can't hear. I am speaking to you. I am preaching the word of God, but you can't relate to this. It does not minister to you. You're dull of hearing because you are in compromise. And that's because there is sin. Sin separates us from God so that the Bible says we can't hear or even God, even if God wants to. And that is why 
we can't hear. Because we are not listening. A man was going through the things of her, of his deceased father, and he finds 25-year-old job order claim for a shoe repair. And curious if the shoe, if the shoes are, were still there, the man brings the job order, 25-year-old job order, to the shoe repair shop. To his surprise, the owner said, "Oh, it's still here. I have a look." He went at the back. He reappeared, and he said, "Come back." It'll be ready next Friday. <laughs> the third reason for God's silence is because you are in the waiting room. You need patience. In his time, not ours, God will speak. And this is what we find in the case of Habakkuk. Finally, after a long silence, God answers. The problem was God's answer creates more questions and more confusion for Habakkuk. The second question was, God, what are you doing? Here is God's answer to Habakkuk. Verse 5. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. God says, I'm going to tell you something that will rock you to the core. You will be astounded. You will be surprised to the core. My answer to your prayers is not what you are prepared to accept, nor would you understand if you receive it. God's way of delivering Judah from the evil and the violence was to give them more evil and violence by bringing the Babylonians, the evil and violent Babylonians. Talk about beyond comprehension. Verse 6. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people, who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swooping to devour. Verse 9, they all come intent on violence. The hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities by building earthen rumps. They capture them. Then they sweep past the wind and go on guilty people whose strength is their God. Does God answer our prayers? Absolutely. Does God hear our prayers? Absolutely. But sometimes his answer is not what we expect. Sometimes our cries of anguish, the answer is not what we want to hear and imagine. Why would we question God's ways? Why would we question God's ways when God gives us the answer? Because we actually have formulated in our minds what we want to do in a, a certain situation. And when we pray, we expect God to do exactly what we formulated in our minds. So that when he moves differently, we get confused. We literally determine how God should act in a certain situation. But God is God. He does what he pleases. He does not always act the way we understand or want to follow. Habakkuk didn't like the answer of God. It was not the answer he wished and wanted. He cannot accept God's way of resolving the issue. So he reacted again immediately. Another complaint, verse 12. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? God is incomprehensible. He is beyond understanding. But it doesn't mean that we can't understand God at all because we can and we do. He has revealed himself in nature and more so in his word and in the person of Jesus Christ. God's incomprehensibility doesn't mean 
that we can understand him, it means that we cannot completely and totally understand him. One, because we are finite and he is infinite. Second, he has not revealed himself fully to us. That is why there is always a dimension of God's nature and character that is always mysterious and beyond comprehension to us. That is why we find his ways mysterious. His being silent when we are in pain is mysterious. His being silent in the midst, in the face of evil and violence and injustice is mysterious. His Unexpected answers is mysterious and even the instruments to accomplish his plans is mysterious. As a great poet William Cowper said, God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. That's why the question of Habakkuk is, God, how can you do this? Habakkuk knows that his people were in moral decline. He knew that they, that the people of Judah have forsaken God for idols of silver and gold. And he thought, well, if God chose to judge them, then fair enough. But what he couldn't understand was that why would God use the more evil and worse people, the Babylonians, to judge his people in Judah? It does not make sense. Why would a holy God use the unholy? Why would the just, a God who justice tolerate the injustices of the Babylonians? To him, it is contradictory to the character of God. And that is why the answer of God only made him upset and confused even more. And so, we have the questions, the perplexing questions of Habakkuk. Why are you doing, why are you not doing anything? Why are you not fixing the mess of the world? And when God answered, he was puzzled even more. Lord, I can't understand your ways. So now the question for us is, or the questions for us rather are, what would you do? How would you respond if God gives you what you didn't expect? What would you do? If God does not live up to your expectations, what would you do? If God answers your prayer and you get more confused, more overwhelmed, and even more frightened than you were before. Now, let me give you or let me remind you of these two basic truths because this will help us if ever we come and we will to such a situation. One, we know God's plan only after we know God's plan. Is that confusing? We know God's plan only after we know God's plan. What I mean is this. God's plan is unknowable except in retrospect. God's plan is unknowable except in retrospect. We can understand God's ways only by reading it backwards. And this is why we have to wait upon the Lord. This is what Habakkuk did. Chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. You notice he hasn't received the answers to his questions and confusion. But he waits. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that the herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. Look at the proud, their spirit is not right in them. But the righteous shall live by faith. In my over 30 years as pastor, I have seen it both ways. I have seen people like you, Christians, who come to church, seemingly very active in the Lord, very committed, joyful in the Lord. But then when hard times and hardships come, I have seen people like you who have quit, have given up their faith. They packed up 
left the church, left Christianity, and left the God of Christianity. But I've also seen people have gone through terrible and most difficult times and circumstances. Yet out of those times, their faith was strengthened and they become more committed and dedicated to God. I wonder how some of you would be categorized when you fall into hardship. And you will. It is inevitable. Habakkuk didn't become an atheist. He didn't give up on God even though there were a lot of questions that were left unanswered, even though he was confused by God's ways. He still trusted in God. His faith was tested and tried. There were still a lot of things that he wasn't convinced or understood, and yet he stayed with God. He struggled to understand God. When God told him something, he struggled to understand. When God showed him something, he struggled to understand, and yet he stayed with God. In John 13, verse 7, the Lord Jesus said to Peter, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Later. You know, much of the Christian life is spent trusting the Lord now and understanding him later. Are you with me? Amen? Much of the Christian life is spent trusting the Lord now and trusting him or understanding him later. In my Christian life, there were times I didn't understand God's ways. Times, not just once. And I questioned God through tears. I couldn't understand God's ways. And like Habakkuk, I prayed for a long period of time and God was silent. I couldn't understand his ways or what he's doing in my life, what he was doing in my life. But when I look back now at those experiences, I realized that I am a better person now because of the tear-filled seasons. I couldn't see it then. All I can see was my hurt and my brokenness. But now that I look back, I realize that much of those experiences have made me develop a close relationship with God and contributed to who I am today. It was those moments when my face was stained by my tears that I searched God in my brokenness and tears and I found peace in God. It was those during confusing and difficult times that God stretched my faith and brought my dependence and trust in his promises to a higher level. I couldn't understand then. I understand now. There will still be times when I won't understand God, but there's one thing that I am absolutely certain. God loves me. And when that time wherein I can, when that time comes when I don't understand what God is doing, I will hold on to that truth. I don't know if you're going through an experience of pain and God seems far from you. You don't understand why God is, has allowed pain to enter your life and you're probably questioning God's plan for your life. Take heart from God, from Jesus' words. You don't understand it now. You may not understand it tomorrow, but one day you will. You will understand what God is doing in your life. God's heavenly plans may not make sense, always may not make earthly sense, but the voice of trust is, later I will understand. Amen? Second thing, 
The reason we trust God is not because we know what he's doing, but because we know he is God. The reason we trust God is not because we know what he's doing, but because we know he's God. Habakkuk was puzzled and confused about God's ways. He didn't know what God was doing, but he knew God. And he reminded himself who God is. Verse 12, once again. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you, never, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Habakkuk was puzzled. Why would God send the evil Babylonians to judge Israel? This does not make sense. I don't know God, what God is doing, but I know God. God is everlasting. From everlasting to everlasting, he does not have a beginning. He does not have an ending. And he is immutable. He's unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And he is sovereign. He's in control of everything and nothing happens apart from his will. What all this means is that if God allows the Babylonians to happen, if God allows this or that, then God has a purpose beyond my comprehension. God was here before me. God will be here when I'm gone. You know what Habakkuk is teaching us here? He's teaching us how to tackle the perplexing problems of life. When you run into a stone wall, when you can't, we don't know, you're confused what to do with the problems of life, stop, step back away from your problems and think about the truth, what you know of the truth about God. And then you can face, go back and face your problems. Are you following me? In other words, your starting point is important. If you start with your problems and your trials, then you're not going to make it. If you start with cancer, you're never going to see God. If you start with rape, you'll never see God. If you start with divorce, you will find God. You will hardly find God. If you start with bankruptcy, you will not find God. Start with God and then move towards your trials and your problems. Amen? Say, Lord, I don't understand my situation, but I know you. You are God of the impossible. I may not understand or know how I can get away or through this, but I know you, you are a faithful God. You're a loving God. You're a gracious God. And that's how you go through the perplexing problems of life, just like Habakkuk. If you don't, then you won't find God. If you start with your problems, if you start with your trials, God may be there, but you can hardly see him. You've got to start with God. Amen? The reason we trust God is not because we know what God is doing, but because we know he is God. We trust him even if we don't know his plans and his timings. We trust God even if we don't know the future. We trust God even if times are difficult because he is our God, our Father, and our Savior. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord.